So like Paul, our wish here is that you be filled with the things of God. So let's turn our ears to our brother Nathan. This is This is Winfield Bible School 2019. Our speaking brother is our brother Nathan Lewis. The title for his series is The Mind of Christ. And the title for this second talk is The Promise, The Spiritual Mind. Well, thanks, Brother Claude, and good morning, brothers and sisters. Well, we uh, looked yesterday, didn't we, at the, uh, the dreadful disease, the hideous deformity, as Brother Thomas calls it, that all of us have experienced as we, uh, as we grew up, the carnal mind, the problem that faces us, that is in direct enmity with God. And we looked at yesterday the marvel of the human brain in, in a somewhat simplistic and rudimentary way but hopefully in a way that was helpful to see how it works, physiologically, that is. And you remember, we said that there were three sections to the human brain. The first one was this reptile brain, which really controls the fighting and the feeding and the fleeing response. Our instinctive brain, which Brother Thomas calls our propensities, our lusts. Then we have the mammalian or the emotional brain, which Brother Thomas calls our intellect. And then we have, right across the top here, our human or analytical brain, our higher thinking, which Brother Thomas calls our moral sentiments. And the, one of the most amazing things I thought about this was about a hundred years before the scientist came up with this very simple model of how the brain works, Brother Thomas has all of this in Alpus Israel. These three distinct parts of our brain. Here, here, and here. Look what he has to say. The serpent had propensities and intellect, and so had the woman. But her mental constitution differed from his in having moral sentiments, at the top here, super added to her propensities and intellect. By the sentiments, she was made a morally accountable being, capable of believing, of having faith, and able to control and direct other faculties in their application. The propensities, that's the ones right down the bottom here, enable a creature to propagate its species, take care of its young, defend itself against enemies, collect food, and so forth. Intellect, in the middle, the emotional brain, enables it to do things for the gratification of its senses, but when, in addition to these, a being is endowed with the sentiments up here of conscientiousness, hope, veneration, benevolence, wonder, etc., it possesses a spiritual or sentimental organization which makes it capable of reflecting, as from a mirror, the likeness and glory of God. Isn't that amazing? A hundred years before the scientists figured out some basic things about the anatomy of the brain, Brother Thomas was able to express that in a wonderful way in Alpus Israel. Well, now we come this morning to the spiritual mind. We talked yesterday about the way in which the lower part of our brain, our instincts and our emotions, hijack our thinking. And you remember we said that they react in two milliseconds and then they respond a hundred times faster than our analytical brain. So, in actual fact, a lot of the time, our instinctive brain is monopolizing the nutrients and the oxygen, and our thinking brain can't actually work even if it wants to. And in some cases, the scary thing is, as we know from our experience, our thinking brain might take weeks or months or even years to catch up. Sometimes it's years, isn't it, before we realize, wow, I've been wrong all this time, I really need to apologize and respond with what we might say is a spiritually minded decision or the mind of Christ. 
So this is a horrible thing. This is our problem. A mind that is naturally totally obsessed about itself. Self-preservation, self-gratification, self-comfort, self-enjoyment. It takes over our thinking almost instantaneously. We're like hardwired this way. It's called proneness to sin. And so we all join with the apostle and say, O oh, wretched man that I am. But I hope that you didn't think from what we looked at yesterday that this is just a physiological or anatomical thing. That if we concentrate on thinking more, on exercising this top part of our brain, we can dominate or cure or conquer this way of thinking. It's not just a physical thing. It's not just the wrong chemicals in the wrong place at the wrong time. And Brother Thomas puts it this way in Alpus Israel again. But in the absence of this law and testimony, the moral sentiments are as incapable of directing a man aright as though he were all intellect or all propensities. In other words, the top part of our brain isn't really the answer all of itself. By right direction I mean according to the mind of God. The sentiments are as blind as the propensities when the intellect is unenlightened by divine revelation. The truth of this is illustrated by the excesses into which mankind is plunged in the name of religion. Mohammedanism, Romanism, Paganism and all the infinite varieties of Protestantism are all the result of the co-workings of the intellect and sentiments under the impulse of the propensities. They're all the thinking of the flesh, predicated on ignorance or misconception of the truth. Hence, they are either altogether false or like the diagonalisms of the shrewd serpent, a clumsy mixture of truth and error. In other words, our human brain is not the answer in and of itself. The analytical brain is not the spiritual mind. All three parts of our brain can be equally empty of spiritual thinking. All three parts can be equally useless at directing our path. It is true that the mind of Christ cannot inhabit any other part of our brain than this front part here, the thinking part. It is true that when the mind of Christ dwells in us, it resides up here. But see the important part? Divine revelation. Divine revelation. The law and the testimony. The entering of the mind of God. The spiritual mind is the mind of God inhabiting our thinking brain. It isn't, it's never, the answer is never going to come from up here innately of ourselves. We're actually the problem. We are not the solution. It's only the combination of both of these things our thinking brain and the truth that can have victory by God's grace. Now I'd like you to come back to Genesis chapter 3 and let's just look at the origin of the carnal mind again but this time let's just have a look not at physiologically how it works but morally how it defiles. How does sin happen in our minds? And Eve is the prototype. We won't read all of these verses, but let's just read verses, uh, a few verses from the start of chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desired to make one wise she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat 
and the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked. I want you to look at the process that's happening in Eve's mind. The first thing that we want to notice is that a changed way of thinking always starts with a question. See at the end of verse 1, Hath God said? The serpent introduces doubt. Eve's answer in verse 3 says, God hath said. But the serpent starts out by saying, Hath God said? See the difference? The end of verse 1 and the middle of verse 3. You want to color in those words. Hath God said? God hath said. This is the difference. Look what the serpent did. I want you to consider the three parts of our brain because there are three reasons why we do anything. And maybe unsurprisingly now, you will not be surprised to find that they correlate with the three parts of our brains. So the first reason why we do something is that we can be driven by lust, by our instincts. That's our basic default setting. It's how we are hardwired. We want, so we take. We're hungry, so we eat. This is how a lot of our lives are taken up, our instinctive brain. Then secondly, we can be motivated by fear. That's our emotions. And fear is more powerful than lust. You can desperately lust after something, but brothers and sisters, you won't touch it if you're scared stiff, you'll be caught. This is Eve. That is how dictators rule, by fear. It's an extremely powerful driver for behavior. It's how the Catholics controlled the masses through the Middle Ages. Fear of not going to heaven will make you avoid lusts. But there is a third and far more potent driver for our behavior, and it's called love. That's our rational thinking response. And it is stronger again than fear. Perfect love can cast out fear. You can overcome temptation or lust by fear of the consequences, but nothing will overcome doing the wrong thing more than loving the right thing. Now, I want you to see how the serpent and his thinking unravels and sabotages Eve's thinking. Because don't forget that in verses 2 and 3, she tells the truth by and large. How does she become deceived? Well, firstly, in verse 4, what the serpent is going to do is remove Eve's fear. He's going to remove her fear. Ye shall not surely die. Possibly... The serpent was chewing on the fruit himself as he said that. We don't know, but remember, he's not morally accountable to God's law. Don't be afraid, he says. It's not as you thought. It's safe. God doesn't really mean what he says. The consequences aren't what you think at all. Look at me. I'm touching the fruit. You won't die. Yeah. And he contradicted God with impunity, didn't he? He told the first lie, whoever that was, if I had a lolly, I would throw it to you. <laughs> but what was he doing? He was removing Eve's fear of the consequences. And then look what he does second, secondarily. In verse 5, he removes Eve's love for God. God actually doesn't care about you the way you think. He doesn't want you to eat the fruit because he doesn't want you to be equal to him. He's not telling you everything. He's actually deceiving you to keep you in your place. He doesn't want to share immortality. He's not to be trusted as you thought. Go on. Not only is it not bad, it's going to be amazing. You're missing out. You deserve it. Now, the serpent clearly didn't say any of those things out loud. But Eve is saying them all 
in her mind unconsciously and almost instantaneously remember two milliseconds and her thinking brain is being hijacked and so we can clearly see what happened to Eve with her love of God removed and her fear of the consequences removed she simply fell victim to lust the carnal mind the three lusts of first of John 2 that we know so well the lust of the flesh lust of the eyes and the pride of life they're all there in verse 6 it was all that was left her love of God had been taken away her fear of the consequences had been taken away and so she ate and Adam ate as well she lost her love and trust in God essentially she lost her faith and so we learn that the carnal mind is characterized by an absence of or a loss of faith that's why by the way Hebrews 11 verse 6 says without faith it is impossible to please him and Romans chapter 8 says those that are thinking along the lines of the flesh cannot please God so the thinking of the flesh is the absence of faith it's us losing trust in God and Eve catastrophically lost her faith in God so now we come to look today at the thinking of the spirit or the spiritual mind it's going to be all about the presence of faith all about the presence of faith it's all about restoring our love and restoring our trust in him in fact it's all about him in fact the spiritual mind has got nothing whatsoever to do with our intellectual brilliance nothing to do with our strength nothing to do with our power it's all to do with God and the influence of his word on our minds but before we get to this let's just look before we leave Genesis chapter 3 at the result of the fall sin brought what we know from the New Testament as a defiled conscience and look what it says in Genesis 3 verses 9 to 10 and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him where art thou and he said I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself this is a defiled conscience and the carnal mind is characterized by these three things fear shame and concealment and where these are there is a defiled conscience this is the inevitable result of the carnal mind it defiles us this is an excellent se uh, section out of uh, Alpus Israel by brother Thomas most of you will have read this before but let's just read it together the reader, by contemplating Adam and Eve in their innocency and afterwards in their guilt, will perceive in the facts of their case the nature of a good conscience and of an evil one. When they rejoiced in the answer of a good conscience, they were destitute of shame and fear. They could stand naked in God's presence, unabashed. And instead of trembling at his voice, they rejoiced to hear it as the harbinger of good things. They were then pure and undefiled, being devoid of all conscience of sin. But mark the change that afterward came over them. When they lost their good conscience, terror seized upon them at the voice of God. Shame possessed their souls, and they sought to get out of his sight and to remove as far from him as possible. Now, what was the cause of this? There is but one answer that can be given. And that is sin fear shame and concealment and so entered the carnal mind into the history of the world it was not just the victory of the instincts and the emotions over the thinking brain it was now a morally defiled and corrupt conscience and that is a much bigger problem and so what was the answer well brother Thomas says it's obvious if sin is 
the transgression of God's law and it's evidenced by doubts, fears and shamefacedness, the morbid principle of an evil conscience, what is the obvious indication to be fulfilled in its removal? The answer is blot out the sin and the conscience of the patient will be cured. The morbid phenomena will disappear and the answer of a good conscience will remain. If sin brings an evil conscience, then forgiveness by God can only have one result, a good conscience or a spiritual mind. It was simple, wasn't it? So obvious. The only problem was that forgiveness could only be brought about in God's righteousness by an undefiled, perfect sacrifice. A mind that had never sinned, never given in, to the thinking of the carnal mind. And so the story of the scriptures really is all about the search for this one man. This one man who would be God's solution, who could bring forgiveness of sins. But it was not easy to find. He was not easy to find. Allow me to introduce to you an interesting theme in the scriptures. It's called the no man prophecies and there was no man look at this exodus 2 in the times of moses and he looked about for a deliverer and he saw that there was no man psalm 142 no man that would know me no man cared for my soul it's right through isaiah especially in the servant songs isaiah 41 there was no man, no counselor, no man, none to answer, no man, no intercessor. First of Corinthians 2, the things of God knoweth no man. And in Revelation chapter 5, the apostle John is going to weep because there was no man who could open the scroll, the book, and disclose what God had written in the future. The whole of the scriptures are really a search for this one man who would be able to save the world. And that person, that man, in every instance, was going to be Christ. Now I want to take you to this little place here, which is right in the middle, because this story in Mark chapter 5, I think you'll find, is very insightful as we consider the carnal mind, the spiritual mind, and the fact that Jesus Christ is the answer. Because when we come to Mark chapter 5, we have another no man prophecy. This is an extremely insightful parable into the way that our Lord deals with replaces the carnal mind <clears throat> we looked yesterday didn't we at the uh at the epileptic boy as a parable of the carnal mind <coughs> he was intent on destroying himself you remember throwing himself into the fire and into the water and if there is a better parable a better story to illustrate the powerful nature of the carnal mind it's right here in Mark chapter 5. Look at this detailed description of Legion in the first few verses here and see how perfectly Legion is going to demonstrate the carnal mind. In verse 2 we read that he was come out of the ship immediately there met him one out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. The very first information that we're given about Legion is that he's associated with death, graves, dead bodies. Literally, the tombs should be translated memorials. These are burial monuments. He's living in the past. He's not living in the, he's not connected to the, the present or the future. He's surrounded by, intimately related with, verse 3, living amongst death. This is the carnal mind. Verse 2, he has an unclean spirit. It's the Greek word, 
akathato, it means without purity. Remember we saw that about the carnal mind? Impure, defiled. Verse 3 says, no man could bind him. No man. He's a no man prophecy. He's unrestrainable. Even chains could not keep this man in check. He's absolutely without restraint. This is the carnal mind. Sometimes in verse 4, the lid goes on for a while, but the fetters and chains are useless and he breaks free. We find at the end of verse 4 that neither could any man tame him. That word tame is different to verse 3. It's the Greek word demazo, and it means to domesticate. No one could cure him. No one could integrate him back into, into society. He couldn't be rehabilitated. This is the carnal mind. It's untamable. It's wild. Verse 5 says, always, night and day in the mountains. And we get the sense that, there, that there's no relief for this poor man. It's always, night and day, no break. This man is afflicted. He's tormented, verse 7. He cannot escape his condition. He carries it with him in his mind. And he's in the mountains. Do you remember our first, very first attribute of the portrait of the carnal mind? Ephesians 4, verse 18. Alienated. Isolated. Colossians 1, verse 21. Alienated. Ezekiel 23, verse 17. Alienated. This man cannot be domesticated. He can't be bound. He must be banished. Isolated from everyone else. Alone. This is what the carnal mind does to us. Again in verse 5 we read, he's in the tombs. In fact, in fact, we're told that three times, aren't we? In this little story. In the tombs, he's associated with death, death, death. He's crying in verse 5. He's desperate for a solution. He knows his plight is terrible, but what can he do? Actually, he's got no idea of the solution. He's beside himself. He's insane. Verse 5 says, he's cutting himself with stones. He's hurting himself. What else is this but the carnal mind? It's just like the prophets of Baal, isn't it? On Mount Carmel. This is unreasonable, irrational, destructive behavior. He's intent on destroying himself. Luke chapter 8 and verse 27 adds that he was naked. He was uncovered. He's clearly deranged. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 28 adds, he was fierce. He's hostile. He's angry. He wants to fight. He's going to defend his territory. He's combative and dangerous. This is the reptilian brain in action. It's all about self-preservation. And back in Mark chapter 5, we read in verse 6 that Jesus was afar off. He knows, doesn't he, that he's separated from godly things. And so he runs up, obviously distressed in verse 7, and he cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. He admits in verse 7 that he has absolutely nothing in common with Christ. Poles apart completely different. This, brothers and sisters, is a picture of the carnal mind coming face to face with the mind of Christ. And there is absolutely no common ground whatsoever. This is an amazing story. But you see, as horrific as he was, as unclean as he was, as desperately tormented as he was. It seems pretty obvious, I think from this record, that Legion had watched from his mountain cave the unbelievable miracle of the stilling of the storm at the end of Mark chapter 4. And he knew that there was something incredibly powerful about this man, Jesus Christ. He'd watched in Mark chapter 4 and verse 37 as a great storm had become, in verse 39, a great calm. And maybe he wondered, in his tortured mind, could this man calm the violent storm happening inside my head? 
Do you know Psalm 65 and verse 7 describes the power of God and it says this, It's a power which stilleth the noise of the sea, the noise of the waves, and the tumult of the people. If Christ could still the waves and the storm, if even the wind, verse 41, and the sea obey him, could he bring calm and peace and tranquility to Legion's tortured mind? It certainly seems likely that Legion at least knew something because in chapter 5 and verse 6 he does what all of us who have experienced the carnal mind need to do. He came and he ran and he worshipped Jesus Christ. He prostrated himself. He knew, didn't he, that As it says in Ephesians 2 verse 12, that he was afar off. But he wanted desperately to be nigh, to be near, to be close, to be accepted. Despite his insanity, as we saw yesterday, he had a spiritual hunger. An inner yearning for something better. He knew that the solution was not in himself. He desperately needed Jesus Christ. You know what's so interesting in this story? Legion was powerless to help or save himself. And do you know when you look at Legion and you read these verses, it is so obvious. I mean, he's naked. He's dwelling in caves. He's deranged. He's cutting himself. The man's clearly insane. But the disciples, well, they seem perfectly sane and respectable. But just look, just look at how this story is put together. Because the two stories before and after Legion give us a big lesson in this story. It's obvious that Legion is insane, irrational, running wild in the mountains. But just look in the story before Legion, chapter 4 verse 38, in the storm, The disciples were just as powerless to save themselves. And in the story after Legion, chapter 5 and verse 26, the woman was just as powerless to cure herself. We are all the same, brothers and sisters. It was just more obvious with Legion. He's naked and cutting himself. Whereas the disciples, well, they seem perfectly respectable, well-dressed quite normal human beings but when we put those three stories alongside each other the storm legion and the woman with the issue of blood we can see that actually all of us all of them the disciples legion and the woman were really just as helpless as each other we all desperately need christ and so he threw himself at christ's feet and what does christ do verse 13 And forthwith, Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. What does he do? Why, he takes the animal, the reptilian brain, and he gave it to the animals. He gave it to the animals. And what did it produce in them? Death. He put the carnal mind, our animal-like thinking, to death. It wasn't cured. It wasn't changed. It wasn't rehabilitated. It wasn't fixed, brothers and sisters. It was drowned to death. Legion has all the hallmarks of the carnal mind, an evil or defiled conscience. And what did Brother Thomas say the obvious indication was? Blot out Forgive the sin, and the conscience of the patient will be cured. He took legion's sins, brothers and sisters, and in the words of Micah chapter 7 and verse 19, he cast them into the depths of the sea. Literally, they were drowned, and legion was forgiven, free. Just look at the result. Mark chapter 5 and verse 15. And they came to Jesus, and they see him that was possessed with the demon and had the legion sitting and clothed 
and in his right mind. And they were afraid. It was the power of Christ that could forgive and free and release legion from an evil conscience to a good conscience, to a spiritual or right mind. It was the power of Christ that could reverse Genesis chapter 3 and verse 10. Because if sin entered and bringing with it an evil conscience, fear, shame, and concealment, then now our Lord Jesus Christ has come face to face with the carnal mind and overcome it and given legion a spiritual mind. He's now sitting. He's not hiding in caves. He's sitting openly, contentedly, out in the open. There's no hiding here. He's clothed. He's covered. His nakedness and shame has disappeared with the covering of Christ. And the torment of fear has been replaced by a man who now has confidence and peace. He now has a right mind. Mark chapter 5 in verse 15 is a reversal of Genesis 3 and verse 10. We go from being earthly, sensual, and devilish, confusion in every evil work, James chapter 3, verses 15 to 16, and God or Christ replaces in us a mind that is now pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated. This is the power of Christ in our lives. Actually, this is the promise of God one day to replace our carnal mind with a spiritual one. Actually, it's the mind of Christ. And how did it come? Look at verse 19. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but said unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. This is Christ's compassion. He understands us brothers and sisters. He could identify with every affliction of Legion's troubled mind, and it is with compassion that he orchestrates a replacement. He gave Legion a right mind. And did you notice in verse 15, when the people come to see Jesus, do you know what it says? They come to see Jesus and they saw Legion. He had put on Christ. His mind had been changed. This is the spiritual mind offered to all those who prostrate themselves at Christ's feet, desperate for help and healing and freedom. If we can't see our need, we will never be healed. All of us, brothers and sisters, must come to a point in our lives where we realize that even though we might look like completely normal and respectable disciples, our natural minds unenlightened by divine truth are exactly like legion afflicted tormented we cannot escape our lives are being destroyed and we come to fall prostrate before him to confess that we desperately need him we choose just to be near him we beg to be set free and the choice to do that is right here in this story because did you notice that there are two groups of people in this story. Legion was transformed by the power of Christ. No more fear, no more shame, no more concealment. But look at the people who, despite the miracle, couldn't see their need. Verse 15 says, and they were afraid. Verse 16 says, that they were still ashamed about their swine. And verse 17, they want to hide themselves by pushing Jesus Christ away, by getting him to go out of the area. They are unchanged, unaffected, unforgiven. How thankful can we be, brothers and sisters, that we can see the lesson, know our need before this beautiful man of compassion. So what is the lesson that we have to look at today in this story 
of Christ, confronting the carnal mind and replacing it with a spiritual mind, a good conscience. Well, Legion is able to show for us that the carnal mind, which all of us know how that feels, is not God's ultimate will for us. It is not. It is something that we have to struggle with, but God promises to replace. Now, I just want to share this with you, and we don't have a lot of time to look at this, but you'll remember yesterday, we looked, didn't we, at the portrait of the carnal mind. All of these things, alienated, proud, impure, angry, greedy, progressively corrupted, blind, vain, doubtful, spiteful, forgetful, unstable. Now, all you need to do is grab a concordance and look up the word mind, and what you'll find is that the phrase is almost, is pretty much always, this portrait here, a carnal mind, or the word mind is used in connection with quite a different portrait. The portrait of a spiritual mind. Now we're going to go through this very quickly and you can get this off me later. But here's how a spiritual mind is portrayed in the scriptures. We are joined together. We're made nigh. It's a mind that's lowly and humble. It's a mind that's holy and pure. Stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. It's peaceful and tranquil. Isaiah 26 says, perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Sober-minded and self-controlled. First of Peter says, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Have some self-control. What about First of John 5 and verse 20, we have a mind that grows towards the truth. A mind that wants to be inhabited by the thinking of Christ. It's a mind that beholds the glory of God. It's not blinded. It beholds the glory of God. It's renewed and large. Be ye renewed in the spirit of your mind. Trusting and calm. Be not anxious about many things. It's compassionate and caring. It's forward and ready. This says here, be of a ready mind, steadfast and confident. This is the portrait of a spiritual mind. And in case you didn't get the connection between the carnal mind and the spiritual mind, I want you just to look at this list, these two lists next to each other. And see if you can see how the spiritual mind is the, not only the exact opposite to the carnal mind, but it is the exact answer. Alienated and isolated, adopted, made nigh, joined, hardened and proud, humble and lowly, defiled and impure, holy and pure, angry and hostile, peaceful and tranquil, Given to excess and greed, sober-minded and self-controlled, progressively corrupted of truth, grows towards the truth, blinded, beholds the glory of God, vain and empty, renewed and large, doubtful and anxious, trusting and calm, spiteful and cruel, compassionate and caring, forgetful and unmindful, forward and ready, unstable and easily shaken, steadfast and confident. It's exactly the opposite and exactly the answer to our problem. This is what our Heavenly Father promises to give us, a mind who has stayed on Him. This is the answer to the battle that rages in our heads. And Legion is able to show for us that this is not God's will for us. He has promised us something so much better. You know, Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 29 puts it this way in the RSV. Oh, that they had such a mind as this to fear me, and to keep my commandments, that it may go well with them and with their children forever. It's our Heavenly Father's wish that we have this particular mind. Or what about this in Ecclesiastes 3? 
He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he hath put eternity into man's mind, yet so that it can, he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. God's put something in us that seeks after eternal things, that seeks after something so much better than what we have. Philippians 4 says, and this is, a, this is almost my favorite quote of the whole series, and the peace of God, which riseth above every mind, says Rotherham's, shall guard your hearts and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. This is what God has promised for us. It's his desire that we abandon our carnal minds. We throw ourselves at Christ's feet. And his promise is that if we do, he will cast our tortured evil conscience, the result of our sins, into the depths of the sea. And he will give us a right mind, a spiritual mind, the mind of Christ. And do you know what, brothers and sisters, the most marvelous and amazing thing is? We can't earn it. We can't develop it ourselves. We are the problem, not the solution. Remember, I looked and there was no man. No man can do this. We can't gain the spiritual mind by study and hard work, although those are necessary. We can't try harder in our lives to get it. The mind of Christ, the spiritual mind, is quite simply a magnificent gift. It's just a gift. I'd like you to come to Ephesians in chapter 1. Oh, we have to do some things, and we'll talk about that in our fourth class. But the spiritual mind is never going to come from our innate brilliance. We are the problem not the solution. And Ephesians 1 says this, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you, give unto you, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding, being enlightened, you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of the inheritance of the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, the enlightenment of our eyes, this amazing calling to have Christ's mind in us, is God giving us the spirit of wisdom. It is a gift. First of John 5 and verse 20 says in Young's literal translation, and we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us a mind to know him that is true. Has given us a mind to know him that is true. What a gift. Sitting, clothed, and in his right mind was a gift from the Son of God, received by legion and refused by others. We'll come to 1 Corinthians in chapter 1 because we really do need to go there very briefly because this is the quintessential reading on the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. In actual fact, this is my favorite verse in the whole Bible. Not that that really matters all that much to you, but I'm going to share that with you anyway. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them which love him. Remember Isaiah 55 said, My ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways and thoughts higher than yours. God's character and his plans are beyond us. We can, cannot ever hope to comprehend them. And Legion, brothers and sisters, could not comprehend what a spiritual mind looked like. He couldn't imagine a life without torment. He couldn't imagine what it was like to be in his right mind. He just desperately knew that he needed it and he prostrated himself before Christ, begging for help. We need to have what Mark 10 and verse 15 describes as the humility of a little child to just receive the kingdom. We can't earn it. It's freely given. Look at verse 10. 
but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, this is another no man prophecy, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received, see, it's a gift. We have received, not the Spirit of this world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things which are freely given to us of God. The spiritual mind is a free gift. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. <coughs> Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Verse 16, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? And here's where we get the title for our whole series. But we have the mind of Christ. It's a mind, brothers and sisters, that is freely given to us. It's a gift. It's a gift that we receive. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, are we meek enough to receive this gift as a little child? Look what it says in James chapter 1 and verse 20, 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. This is legion. This is the carnal mind, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. And the contrast to that is 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. It's all about whether we receive the gift or not. It's not about our strength, not about our brilliance, it's about whether we receive this gift. It's the difference between life and death. Are we humble enough to accept God's gift? This is how Brother Thomas finishes this little section in Alpus Israel. The reason why he will not permit men to prescribe for their own evils, is that he is the physician and they the lepers. He, their sovereign, they the rebels against his law. It is his prerogative and his alone to dictate the terms of reconciliation. Man has offended God. It becomes him, therefore, to surrender unconditionally and with the humility and teachableness of a child to receive with open heart and grateful feelings whatever in the wisdom and justice and benevolence of God he may condescend to prescribe. This is what our Heavenly Father has prescribed for our sickness. It's like a medical term, isn't it? A prescription for our souls. This is how we overcome the sickness in our hearts. We open our hearts and we receive God's medicine, the gift of a new mind. We have the mind of Christ engrafted into our hearts by, by taking into us the word of God. And we're not going to look at this tomorrow because we're going to skip entirely class number three, but class number three is all about the process, remember? How we go from the carnal mind to the spiritual mind, and it's all about metamorphosis, transformation. There's only one way that it happens, brothers and sisters, and that is by reading the Word of God, by eating and eating and eating, and like a little grub, like a little caterpillar, we don't even know where we're headed. All we do is eat and we devour the word of God and God turns that little caterpillar into a beautiful butterfly, a completely different creature. Just as Christ <clears throat> was able to take legion and replace his tortured mind with a mind that was at peace, calm, sitting clothed and in his right mind. What a gift, brothers and sisters, we get to enjoy.
being in the truth. I'd like you to come in conclusion to Hebrews chapter 8. This is not us. This is the imperceptible way in which God operates on our minds by the word of God. And it's a gift. You could take a CT scan of your brain at 20 and at 80, and apart from maybe some slight deterioration with age, you are not going to be able to tell the difference. But between 20 and 80, God willing, you will have a completely different mind, a much more spiritual mind. Everything's changed. You're a new creature in Christ. You can't see it. But a miracle has happened inside your mind. It's the entering in of the word of God that transforms us. And it's a gift. It's not what you do or I do. It's God doing it in us. And we just receive the gift with gratefulness. Hebrews chapter 10, sorry, verse uh, chapter 8. Hebrews 8 and verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind. And write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God. And they shall be to me a people. But look what it says in the margin. I will give. I will give into their hearts. Give into their minds. God was prepared to crucify his son. To get his law into our minds. And it's a gift. This is God's promise. To give us a spiritual mind to share with us the mind of his son. What an amazing thought. He desperately wants to see us sitting and clothed in, in our right minds. And all we have to do, brothers and sisters, is throw ourselves at his feet. To say desperately, we need him. To ask him to forgive our foolish ways. To reclothe us in our rightful mind. To have the simple trust to let our striving cease. And let our newly ordered lives confess the beauty of his peace.